documentarians get into the industry for a few reasons. To serve the public, to create that transparency between uh, government and people, uh, to communicate worldly happenings, and to give a voice to the voiceless. So to, provo to provide a platform for storytelling. But it's not always that easy. Uh, I started my career, as Adam said, at one of the top three news networks. And for me, that was a dream job. It was a fascinating opportunity to have. And I quickly learned, uh, once getting there, that news networks care about viewers. And really what that means is that they care about ratings. And ratings is really just code for money, for ad dollars. And so when you walk into a, a news network, a newsroom, a studio, it's actually very exciting. You know, you have these anchors who uh, you've watched for years on TV and, and producers and editors and graphics people and everyone's working together. It's, there's a lot of great energy in, in these type studios. If you haven't been, I, I recommend uh, visiting one. And then when you get back to the office, um, you know, on a daily basis, producers get together in a conference room, they sit around a table and they discuss story ideas um, for the next day's air. So examples uh, of those stories would be, you know, Mitch McConnell endorsed this bill, or a child has gone missing in California, uh, or Honey Boo Boo is signed on for another season. <laughs> and believe it or not, Honey Boo Boo is a big contender in news these days, as is uh, other entertainment and reality shows. It's really starting to dominate airtime, which is something, of course, we never saw in the past. And that's part of this evolution of news media, fueled mostly by money and ratings. So as I mentioned, you know, what sells? You know, producers are sitting around the, the, uh, the conference table and, and you realize that they're not just producers, they're business people who are crafting a product to make sellable. Like any other company, if the product doesn't sell, the company doesn't stay afloat. But when that's content, it has sort of a deeper consequence. So between Mitch McConnell and Honey Boo Boo, <laughs> Honey Boo Boo often wins out. It's true, this is true. And this is something that I realized very quickly working at a news network, sitting in on these meetings thinking, geez, we have a responsi responsibility to tell these powerful stories, stories that can have a great impact, and we're telling stories about reality TV. And so while at that network, I learned very quickly that there are mandates by which you should go by when producing a story. So teases are a huge thing. Teases get viewers. So if you're taking time away from substantial content, you know, from information that we're supposed to be delivering to the viewer, but you're putting it in a tease, tease isn't really, you know, serving the viewer, but it's, it's getting the viewer and it's getting the rating, then that's okay. Clips shouldn't be longer than three seconds, stories shouldn't be longer than 90 seconds, two minutes, because you know, millennials have ADHD and don't have attention spans that will last more than two minutes, whether on TV or on digital. That was a big one, you know, it's like time, really quick. Flashy graphics, sound effects, um, the, you know, you just really wanna punch the viewer with this quickness so that they don't change the channel. If they change the channel, we lose money. Entertainment, movie references, these are all really important mandates when uh, producing a news story. And as a viewer, you may not realize it, it just kind of you know, hits you and, and you don't necessarily know why it's happening. A movie reference, for example, you could be telling a very serious story, say, um, about a natural disaster, you know, deadly tornadoes hit Missouri. And you know, a senior producer will come into the edit room and say, why don't you leave the segment with a clip from Twister? I think that'll really you know, get the viewers in. And meanwhile, you know, there are hundreds of people that are dying from these natural disasters, and you're sort of wondering, you know, why am I leading a segment with Hollywood? But we're seeing it more and more in news media. So with these mandates, um, our show went from being uh, the number two show to the number one show. And to kind of put into perspective how big a deal that was, we weren't able to do that for 15 years. And even when Diane Sawyer was the lead anchor of the program, she wasn't even able to bring the show to number one. So this was, I mean, it was a massive, massive deal. Everyone was writing about it. You know, we were getting Emmys and all kinds of accolades and morale in the office was at an all-time high. And as a young producer, it was a really special time, I felt like, to be the news network. But, you know, slowly as our, our ratings were skyrocketing, my opinion of our content 
was going down. In case you didn't um, catch that really complex idea, I've very articulately <laughs> put it, uh, you know, here. <laughs> My creativity is not reflected in this PowerPoint, but I swear it exists somewhere. <laughs> But so I was having this internal conflict, and you know, I got into journalism, as I mentioned before, because you know, what a responsibility to be able to tell a story that could have an impact, that could change the world. And you know, here I was producing content that I wasn't necessarily proud of, but it, it was a strange feeling because we were winning, and, you know, and everyone was, was patting us on the back, and it was, it was um, you know, we were told that we were doing a great job. And so I said, okay. I'm going to start, you know, pitching stories that I think are important, stories that I think deserve airtime. And something very personal was going on in my life at the time. Um, one of my best friends from childhood was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. And she was 21 years old, honor student at Cal Berkeley, uh, Pac-10 athlete of the year. I mean, a real, real superstar. When you're diagnosed with stage four lung cancer, you have a 2% chance of living more than a year. So it's it's uh, a cancer that's extremely underfunded, um, does not get the awareness that it deserves because of the stigma that's attached to it. She was never a smoker. She didn't grow up with smokers. And so I started to look into lung cancer. You know, how did someone like my friend Jill get lung cancer? It ends up that 25% of people who get lung cancer are non-smoking women. And many of those women are young women, like Jill. So I thought, God, nobody knows this. You know, this is, this is such a, a, a powerful thing. This is something that people need to know about so that you know, uh, there can be more awareness and therefore more research and funding. And so I pitched this story to the network, you know, and, and I included that it was a, you know, a personal thing to me and, and that this was a really underreported story. And they rejected it. They didn't take the story pitch. And so I thought about it again, and I repitched it. And again, they turned it down. And, and I pitched it in five different ways to five different shows at the network trying to get this on air, because I really felt that it was important. They didn't go for it. And at that point, I realized ratings were very clearly coming before story. And story was the reason that I got into the industry. My friend passed away. And um, soon after, our other uh, best girlfriend, someone who we had also grown up with since the age of four, her name's Kelsey, she's an incredibly inspiring person, she decided that she was going to run across the country, step by step, over 3,000 miles, to raise awareness and to raise funding for lung cancer. And so I thought, here's my second shot at this. I'm going to pitch this story. How can they not air it? So I pitched this story. And again, it was turned down. And I thought, what the hell? This is crazy. You know, this is such an important issue. How are we not telling the story? And again, you know, I, I pitched it again and I pitched it again, and they didn't go for it. I was able to blog about it and write articles, but it didn't make airtime. And that's really where you get the viewers and really how you, you spread important messages. I was deeply frustrated on a personal level, on a professional level, level that our network wasn't telling this story. And so I thought, you know what, maybe it's just because it's, it's a, a personal, uh, personal story for me. I'm going to try pitching other stories. And so I started pitching other stories that I thought were important. Stories like uh, the epidemic of sexual assault on campus, uh, rampant injustices in our prison system, uh, rising hate groups in America. Stories that I thought were, were you know, really underreported in important stories. They all got rejected. And it's actually a very kind of nerve-wracking thing as a young producer pitching stories uh, at the network because you give the leaders of the industry a glimpse into your, into your mind. And, uh, you know, so it, it can be a little bit scary. But I had sort of had it. And so I pitched them all again. And they all got rejected. And I went into my coworker's office and I said, God, what's going on? Why, why aren't they, you know, taking these stories I'm going to pitch them again. And he's looking at me like, you're crazy. You know, if they turned them down the first time, they're going to turn them down the second, third, and fourth time, too. And I actually started getting a nickname, nickname around the office, which was the stage five story clinger. <laughs> Wedding crashers, anyone? Um, but I didn't care. You know, it was, it was 
it was stuff that I cared about, and so I, I continued to pitch. They continued to get turned down. And the final straw for me was when I was tasked with um, booking one of the housewives of Beverly Hills. That was my assignment one day. So I pick up the phone, and I'm talking to this person. I hang up the phone, and I say, what the hell am I doing here? You know, everything that I had dreamt of, of, you know, of doing as a journalist, I was not living. I wasn't even close to living. And so I quit. And I realized that that was a really you know, uh, coveted position. You know, a producer at a news network, I'm sure a lot of people would kill for that position. But I decided to quit, which is very responsible as someone in their mid-20s with no job offers and no savings. <laughs> um, and I launched a Kickstarter page to do a documentary, a story that I thought was underreported. Um, it's, uh, the story was on UN peacekeepers who had allegedly been raping Haitian teens and women. Like a really horrific abuse of power story. And nobody was reporting on it. And so we raised the money, um, had some really great supporters behind us, and we went down to Haiti and we shot this documentary. And a company called Vice Media caught wind uh, that we were doing this documentary. And uh, Vice Media was a company that I had admired for years. They do really uh, impactful, impactful work. And so they called me up and asked me to come in for a meeting. And shortly thereafter, they commissioned uh, one of my documentaries. And so I set out to do this new documentary, and I rejected all of the mandates that I had learned at the network. You know, you can't have a story more than a minute and a half. I made mine 20 minutes. No flashy graphics, no crazy sound effects, none of that stuff. Actually, I took one of the mandates, which was the movie TV reference thing, but hear me out. I found a guy who was building a meth empire, who also had a family on the side, whose name was actually Walter White. So, <laughs> cut me some slack, I, I had to call it the real Walter White. But so this documentary did exceedingly well. It got 10 million views, nearly 10 million views online. And disclaimer here, you can't really compare TV and digital views because they don't work the same. Um, but I'm going to continue to shamelessly compare the two. <laughs> so 10 million views, to put that into perspective, that's about 15 times more views than any cable show would get on their very best breaking news day. It was, it was really kind of uh, a, a massive success. And what I learned when making this documentary is that in that natural evolution of news media, a void had been created there was this audience that really did want real, raw, substantial storytelling. And a lot of these viewers were young viewers. They were millennials who I had been told for years, you know, oh, they don't watch anything, you know, more than 90 seconds. But these were my people, you know, and I really felt like there, there was an audience that wanted this. I think so often in news media, we try to cater to conservatives and liberals, women, millennials, Hispanics, these different groups. But what I found is that when you stop catering to these groups and you just tell a great story, amazing things can happen. And I'm not saying that Vice is the, the be all, the end all, you know, the solution to news media. And in fact, when you look at the timeline of history of news, we're actually, we're very young but we're leading the pack in many ways. And this idea of, of not catering to viewers really resonated with me just in the last six months. I'm very lucky in that I get to travel a lot for my job and meet really fascinating people and, and tell interesting stories. And just in the last six months, the following people have uh, come up to me in public or written me online uh, and thanked me for our work and, and told us that you know, they, they appreciate our work, people from all walks of life. A 25-year-old Palestinian guy in Ramallah. A few days later, a group of young Israelis uh, in a bar in Tel Aviv. Uh, conservative American militiamen on the Texas-Mexico border, I'm talking like hardcore camo, face masks, big guns, big Glenn Beck fans. A few weeks later, um, a Democratic state senator who I spent a few days with, a middle-aged mom at JFK, an Iowa farmer, some Brooklyn hipsters who might be the, the obvious target, um, 
but you know, an, an ISIS supporter, all kinds of people who have different political ideologies who come from all ends of the earth had all told me the same thing in different words, which was that they just wanted an honest portrayal of life. And what that told me is that storytelling is most powerful in its most basic, authentic form. Thank you.